Gregory J. Robb, or uh, if you meet him on the street, just Greg, <laughs> began his odyssey to publish half a million words online before even starting his first book. That's amazing. <laughs> just to get started, <laughs> half a million words. Um, Trans Science, From Failure to Future in a Sacred Family, which was published in 2015. His second book is currently in the final stages of production. So let me introduce, introduce to you an extremely prolific writer, Gregory J. Robb. Thank you. I appreciate being here, and I want to thank the Port Moody Library all who organized it. Some things need to be written, and uh, this book erupted as a response to a big change in family. So it caused a great deal of introspection, but what surprised me was 57,000 words in 37 days. Um, naturally, first draft, but uh, I'd never really been through something like that. So I decided there was enough to, to keep going and to develop it. So I'd just like to share uh, sections of certain chapters with you tonight. So this is from the introduction. My father had always considered his final circumstance to be his worst nightmare. His worst fear was that they would open him up and find cancer. So when the worst nightmare did come alive, it felt strange indeed to see such a Scottish battler wither up and accept his fate. Nothing could prepare me for my last visage of the man. His tiny hands contorted into eagle-like claws, clutching a blanket up to his neck. Mouth wide open, head propped skyward. I stopped at the doorway and put a hand up to my own gaping mouth. So this really is it. He managed two thoughts. I'm sorry, and I love you. All I could say was, okay. I didn't know what else to say because he had never spoken those words to me before. In less than five minutes, the medication took his awareness away and his eyes cast up again to the ceiling. He was gone, but still breathing. As I trundled to the hospice elevator, I tried to grasp the greater tragedy that my father had died or that we had never had a loving relationship. I remember wondering then if silence might numb the pain. And I was wrong. This is from chapter one. I will always smile widely at one gift that dad might take back if he could. My brother and I had been introduced to piano at early ages, but Big Bro had switched to drums. One day, just for fun, I wanted to know what it felt like to hit a crash cymbal. He agreed, and he gave me the stick. I smashed that thing as hard as I could, and love was born. My first official performance was in grade seven. I played along to a song by Kiss, alone on the school stage with blaring music and bright lights. I remember feeling like a roadie when my father pulled up to the gym door with my brother's drums inside. I took my time with each trip, savoring every step and preserving my siblings' treasured possession. Of course, I only had the stamina to play to a four-minute song, but that was plenty for me, and I was inspired just by the opportunity of doing it. Mr. Dallimore, Marlborough Elementary School's janitor, provided the inaugural opportunity to play in Canada's one and only harmonica band. Mr. D taught us kids during lunch breaks and he held after school rehearsals. He was not traditionally trained, but he had a fantastic ear. He showed all of us how to play a mean harmonica. Curiously, this is how I would come to first meet Carrie Bud Remner, the band's lone guitarist. One day, Bud poked his head through my open bedroom window to interrupt my drum practice. I was curious about this stranger being so affable and forward. He shook my hand and said, you're an excellent drummer, man. I cut through here all the time, and I'm really impressed with the way you're improving. Oh, uh, thanks. We should jam sometime, he said. So I had my first rock band with Bud Bremner and Ray's Lakovitz, a friend who bravely stood with me against grade eight bullies at Royal Oak. Both came to be friends and esteemed musical colleagues. Quite simply, they rocked. And we pushed the envelope of musicianship with Rush, Deep Purple, Kiss, and David Bowie, to name a few. 
However, we were no more determined than any legion of other area kids who were turned on to tunes. As that grew, some of the neighborhood kids would peer into my parents' basement to see what was happening. Things were definitely happening. I learned three important lessons during that period. One, if you're lucky, people will tell you when you've found your calling. Two, no audience can replace family acceptance. Three, the need for affirmation can be used as a weapon against you. This is from chapter six, then there were three. Previously, I had listened to popular radio and enjoyed the most famous musical acts of the time. Elton John, Billy Joel. As a family, we bobbed our heads to tunes by the Fabulous Four. Herman's Hermits, Tom Jones, Engelbert Humberton. Okay, that was for mom. <laughs> These artists created songs to which one could whistle, and I seized any such chance to raise my spirits with that. I was up to, at the upper end of elementary school, and I could feel transition in the air. It would travel through song. As it happens, 1975 was a musically significant year. For Christmas of 74, my brother gave me a record. So I opened this thin square present to find the word rush, scrawled in a circle above the cool cover illustration, and the words caress of steel in a circle below the graphic. Great, I said, thanks. <clears throat> What's Rush? <laughs> Kiss and Rush demonstrated my oncoming transition very well. Even at 11, I could feel the child in me revel with Kiss. A new, more introspective me began to dwell at length on Rush. Kiss gave me the zing, and Rush made me think. It was a wonderful contrast that catered to both the injured child and the emerging adolescent. I would follow both bands for decades to come. Chapter 11, <clears throat> The Cost of Acquiescence. We all own our decisions and we live with them. That's the adult world. An individual's background and upbringing clearly influence those decisions, but they are not what define our lives. We are the authors of our lives. I get to write my book and my decisions are its contents. One encounters certain words on approach to such decisions, passion, belief, wish and want. Other words come in slightly dimmer font colors like should, compromise, settle, get by. These words are woven into the lexicon of thoughts that lead us to do what we do. When toxins are introduced to the mix, judgment can go haywire. Codependence is one especially influential toxin, a sense that you simply cannot realize your dreams or potentials without being attached to another person. Even if the other is good for you, it is unhealthy to shoulder all the blame while sharing none of the glory. This affords the other an unhealthy place inside one's sense of identity, and it can blur that identity to the owner's detriment. If so, the relationship itself is built on shaky foundations. So is your relationship with yourself. This is chapter 15, Raising the Shark. I arrived at the lecture to my introduction to poetry class having missed the morning tutorial. We had submitted our first essays based on a life experience and I was looking to retrieve my paper at the lecture. My teacher spotted me first and leaned into the row to ask if I could speak with her afterwards. The little voice inside me uttered, oh no. First assignment, first semester, first feedback. She spotted the look and said, don't worry, it's not a problem. It may not have been a problem to her, but my head was full of chaotic internal talk throughout the lecture. Let's walk, she said. I want to discuss something. I really liked your piece, she continued. I'm a co-editor of a literary journal up here. We publish through the English department, and I'd really like to publish your work. What? <laughs> I'd like to publish your piece. She smiled and we continued the logistic part of the discussion all the way up to the English department. She asked for some revisions and I was only too happy to tweak the story. After some brief hiccups in the timeline, the little guy's purpose appeared in volume three, number three of Nexus, a literary journal. Ironically, the little guy's purpose was a story of one of my greatest musical moments on stage. 
seems absurd to have missed the connections then, but it's germane to observe them here. The story worked because it was written out of pure passion. What shocked me was more fundamental. I didn't realize until that Friday, December 15th, 1989, that I really did love words. Words like music are a language, and they were the very ingredients of our splendid human story. Only when my words were accepted for publication did I fully recognize it. But there was more. When I found the journal on the shelves of the SFU bookstore, something changed in me. I felt completely, fully, and utterly alive. I felt honored to know that someone somewhere might read this story and enjoy it. My name would be part of history, and it didn't matter how many people bought it. At least there would be some indication that I existed. That was awesome. Whatever it took to make this happen again, I would do it. The little voice had grown beyond its insecure rasp and spoke directly from my core. This is what I'm supposed to